Good evening, fellow heretics. Welcome to tonight's show. My co-host Natty Nat is not with us tonight. She might pop in later. Not exactly sure. But in any case, we have a very special guest waiting for us backstage before we bring him on. Let's watch that. <laughs> Under your butts. All right. Not Welcome, bad. Dr. Kip Game Wow, the, the chat is popping. How y'all doing tonight? Glad to see y'all. Thank y'all I'm for doing joining. Good. Oh, yes. Hi, chat. And thanks yeah, for joining. Not you. I don't, I don't care <laughs> no. what you're doing. I'm worried about the chat. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know you're doing good. You've got a beer next okay. to you. You're, you're doing great. I Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> So, so Dr. Kip know. is our uh, our yeah. guest tonight. He's a Dead Sea Scroll scholar. Um, I didn't have I didn't I didn't have your introduction pulled up, but it's in the description. All his, Should all I, his uh, do you want me to uh, introduce myself? I've done this. Yeah, you know what? That I've would done be this fantastic. Little... Okay. So I'm you Kip. Uh, Kip else. Davis. I I run a YouTube channel that is under my own name. Um, I, uh, uh, oh, maybe this isn't going as well as I hoped. <laughs> um, so I am a, uh, I'm a specialist, looks, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm a specialist in, uh, early Judaism and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, I have a PhD from the University Kip's of channel. Manchester. Link in the description below. Go. Highly recommend. Yeah. Sorry, good. I've held uh, I've held uh, uh, teaching and research positions at universities in Europe and in Canada, um, and uh, on my channel I like to do uh, counter apologetics, biblical studies, and I just recently started a, um, a new series all about the Dead Sea Scrolls that I am very very excited about, and I hope that everyone checks it out. Yeah, y'all, y'all definitely should. Um, his videos are, he doesn't make videos as often as I would like, but I only say that because I really enjoy them and, <laughs> and I'd like to watch them more often, but he does put a lot of work into them. You, you can, yeah. so it, it, they definitely take a while to produce. Um, they're very enjoyable, very informative. Yeah. If, if you're not, if you're not subscribed to his channel, you're wrong. All right. You're, you're just wrong. Um, <laughs> Take it from the guy with the with the badass hair here, right? He's gonna come. Is that down, you or me? Come down your throat if you don't. Hey yo! Oh, I know was the yeah. audio off. Is my audio? All right. We're going now. Not you much. You can hear me, right? Um, yeah, everything sounds good on my end. Okay. Sorry if you guys are having issues. All right, so. Uh, so I reached out to Dr. Kip originally because I've been hyper fixated on the book of Isaiah lately, um, which sounds boring, but no, man. Uh, Isaiah is arguably, according to John J. Collins, one of the most complex books in the entire Bible. Um, it jumps all over the place timeline wise. Um, that's one thing I really like to do. Uh, when studying the Bible is try to map out a timeline of when everything is happening. And then when you get to Isaiah, it's, it's all over the place, man. So it's, yeah, this is a big reason why scholars, oh, it's not, it's not. (laughs) (laughs) See, this is Um, why when you, when you open, when you open a commentary on Isaiah and, and you crack open a few of them, you're going to get like a, a structure or an outline. And almost all of them are going to look, you know, quite a bit different from one another. Yeah. Just because it's like, we honestly, we have no idea um, how, well, I, I shouldn't say that. I mean, we've got, we've certainly got ideas about, about uh, big ideas about how the book was put together, but we really have no idea in terms of like the organizing principle for many parts of it it's and it can be really frustrating so hey pat what is this mad act with pat that does that does roll off the tongue a little bit better than discovering ancient history with 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 pat lowinger so it's 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 shorter i like it 
it's it's good i like that pet hey i just wanted to say um now that pet's here and it's so awesome that uh that pet's here so um i had i had such a a fantastic opportunity last week i was in uh i was in washington state um at the myth vision studios filming yes. uh filming I, I should have linked that below but yeah I'm, I'm i'm excited about that too yeah so i'm really excited about the course the course is going to be great um so i spent a week doing that but then like uh the day before i came home pat messaged me and he's like hey if you're coming through seattle let's let's uh let's get together let's uh let's do it so as i was uh as i was driving home um i i stopped in a in an adorable little town just on the uh on the southeast side of seattle and uh i met uh i met pat we grabbed some dinner uh we chatted Did for you? a couple hours it's the first time oh, we've so uh, we've jelly. met face to face it was so great so yeah i just uh i just i just had to share i love I, that, that's one of the fun, you know, you meet people, you meet people online, but it's just, it's, it's so fun to, uh, to make personal connections with, uh, it's, it's so weird you... because the, you, I experienced this and there, there's some people in the chat that met me at the, uh, American atheist convention last year. Um, you, you meet for the first time in person, but it's like, it's like, you've always known each other, you know, it's like, like you, you right. Feel yeah. Like you, you it's already true. Know each other. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's weird. It's, it's super cool. So yeah, I can imagine. It's like before. Yeah. Like before I, before I went to, uh, before I left to go to, uh, Derek's, um, <clears throat> I was talking to, uh, uh, Josh, uh, jo Dr. Josh Bowen of, uh, uh -huh. digital Hammurabi. And he told me, he said, yeah, he says, when you meet Derek, he's, he's exactly like, like you picture him and he wasn't kidding. It was, uh, the Derek that you see online is, is the Derek like every day in in his house and and yeah. with his family and and everything it was very cool so oh and i also I, while i was down there i also had the chance to uh to to meet uh and spend a lot of time with uh with derek bennett of uh atheologica oh. so yeah yeah it was great is there is there any content that's going to be coming out from that from from derek bennett you meeting with Derek not Bennett? featuring yeah, him like and me okay. no not the two of us uh so yeah it, in fact he's kind of like so he's made this like this is a this is a cross-country uh permanent move for him now uh so he's just kind of he's still getting uh settled in uh to to things there but uh but yeah i'm in the future you know it'd be fun he's a he's a fun guy so so are you, are you planning on making more trips here down to the states or for other projects i'd like to yeah, so future. yeah and and we've we've talked about it maybe we'll do um like we've got some ideas for for more courses in the future um i'd like to do a course on the book of jeremiah I'd like to do a course on uh, the Deuteronomistic history, which is uh, oh. like like Joshua through Second Kings, and as it relates to uh, um, uh, to the Book of Deuteronomy. I did a um, so this is something that that it will be like while I was there filming for the course. Derek also had like like patron questions that he wants you to answer and stuff too, right? Um, so we did lots of that, and then he wanted some side recordings and uh so one of the side recordings was all about uh like josiah's reforms and and the deuteronomistic history and the book of deuteronomy and i i just i eat that stuff up i love that stuff so yeah why not a course eh i think it'd be yeah. cool that's that's the weird thing and that's a criticism i get a lot on on my channel on TikTok is oh for someone who doesn't believe you you sure spend a lot of time talking about this. And I'm like, because oh, it's man. so much more interesting. Oh, then when, when you don't, when you're not reading something into the text, when you're trying to read the text for what it is, what it actually says and what it does not say, it, it's yeah. so much more fascinating yeah. than when you're going into it, thinking you have the Holy spirit. It's helping you interpret <laughs> it accurately. Um, like it, 
like that, that's boring as fuck. You know, you is it ever? Answers before you. Read. You don't even right. feel like and, you need to and, read it. That's why most Christians don't. No, read. and the answers, like the answers never change, right? Like no matter what what inputs you you add from that perspective, you're you're always coming out on you know with the same conclusion. There's just there's just nothing. There's just nothing to be learned. There's nothing very interesting there. Uh, it's nuance. way more exciting looking at uh, like you know uh, we're we're going to spend lots of time talking about this tonight with the book of Isaiah. But one of the one of the very very cool things uh, that that you know you can do while you're reading this text is go, oh look at this look at this prophecy here in chapter nine. Like where does this correspond historically? And why? And what's going on, mm -hmm. right? Like it's it's uh, that kind of stuff is uh, to to my mind. It just it helps to make the it really helps to make the text just come to life, because it's not just Isaiah sitting here channeling God, right? As he's as he's feeding him this mm -hmm. information. No, he's he's a real guy who's living in this city in Jerusalem amid some like real uh interesting periods of time he's he's living during the uh the Syrah Ephraimite war he's living during the uh the the Ass Assyrian uh invasion of the northern kingdom and the destruction of the northern kingdom and then this this uh this incursion of the ins the Assyrians down south to Jerusalem right like there's 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 tons of politics at work and sociology oh, and yeah. and yeah. economics, you know, happening like right in the text. Why wouldn't we want to tease all that out? Yeah, there's also all these like uh, these groups who are very devout to their uh, their religion, Yahwehism, we'll call it. Um, yep. And they they they've they've got everything figured out. Everything's good. They've got a temple. They've got the ark. They've they've got us. And then suddenly, uh, was it King Nebuchadnezzar like ransacks their their promised land and kicks them out? They go what? And that's where we start getting portions of Isaiah and Ezekiel and uh, Daniel, and you and you start to see how they're trying to reconcile how this happened with. While they're still believing they're in God's will, they they, they can't think yeah. that God's abandoned them. They they have to think that this is a lesson that their God is trying to teach them. So they they don't have the ark, they don't have a temple anymore. They're in the desert. They don't have food or water, yeah. and they're like, oh, God must be trying to teach us something. So you see, like yeah. this dramatic shift, uh, and then they get invited back into the promised land by um, King Cyrus or Cyrus the Great, which is a Persian king. And the fact that the Bible calls him Cyrus the Great is, is pretty, pretty substantial. Um, the anointed one. King, so they come back. The Messiah. In. The Messiah yeah, Cyrus the Great. A Messiah. A literal Messiah. Um, they considered him. And so they get in there. Yep. They, have a, they have a favorable view about him. So why wouldn't they start wow. adopting some of his beliefs into their own? So you start seeing things change a little bit when they come back. Um, yeah. But yeah, like yeah. The, the, the evolution of these ideas is fascinating. Uh, it really is. Yeah. No, yeah. I, um, I was actually just reading an article um, like a week ago, uh, specifically about uh, the, the article itself hey, was, about, um, was about, uh, oh, look, it's Melody. Hi. Uh was about um uh Pesher Isaiah uh and and Pesherim mm -hmm. uh this this these types of texts that that are look like commentaries on the Bible in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um but there's part of the article uh I mean there's lots of interesting parts in the article but at one point the author uh talks about um the book of Isaiah in specifically second Isaiah, like this, this later, uh, section that, uh, that was written. Words, right? Sorry. Chapter 40 in all words is generally considered to be second Isaiah, right? Generally, but I think there's, there's reason to, to think that it, it's, it, it's, it's not necessarily, and we could talk a little bit about, yeah, about we can get into that. Yeah. 
so um but the 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 author here um spends a lot of time um uh comparing uh the uh the babylonian uh chronicles of uh cyrus's uh in cyrus's o uh occupation his 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 defeat of uh the babylonian rulers and then his occupation of babylon comparing that to to the way second isaiah uh talks about uh Cyrus, it's very interesting because what's happening in Babylon, uh, historically speaking, prior to the arrival of Cyrus, the last uh, king of Babylon was uh, Nabonidus. And uh, Nabonidus was was not part of the uh, of the same dynasty as uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his father, uh, Nabopolassar. Uh, and he, he, uh, he neglected, uh, the temple and abandoned the worship of Marduk, uh, during his reign. And he actually took off and then went out into, uh, into the desert and, uh, he set up, uh, a, 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 a whole, um, shrine, uh, for worship of the, of the God sin. And, uh, and this, God, this enrages, right. This enrages the priesthood, the the priesthood of Marduk in Babylon. So they are absolutely thrilled at the fact that Cyrus is coming in because what Cyrus very cleverly does is he's like, oh, you know, I am a a good devout worshiper of Marduk. I will uh, repair your temples. I will make sure that... Uh, that uh, you guys are well looked after and that and that we uh we restore the cult unlike that that terrible heretic uh uh Nabonidus who uh you know who I'm I'm overthrowing and when you look at the literature that came then out of the uh out of the temple this is the the Babylonian literature produced by the priests of Marduk and you set it right beside um second Isaiah and and how it presents Cyrus is very, very similar, you know, is very flattering, um, um, apologetic, uh, propagandistic uh, texts uh, lauding the work and the person and the administration of uh, Cyrus. It's pretty great. So, so what do you make of, of that? Like, do you think, be, because when, when Isaiah is recording these things, he's recording them a little bit later. So you think he's trying to like, um, like retell the story about, about second how... Isaiah, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, is he trying to retell the story to because? Oh, sorry, I, I have so many questions. I'm having a hard time. <laughs> so, so ne Nebuchadnezzar, the the account of Nebuchadnezzar going mad and eating grass and everything for mm -hmm. 40 days or 40 weeks what it yep. was that very closely parallels the account of nabonidus which was discovered in the dead sea scrolls which you were just yes. talking about yes. um why do you think why do you think they they replaced they made that comparison or they replaced um nebuchadnezzar with nabonidus do you think it was like a translation thing or were they trying to rewrite no uh history no. so i actually talk a little bit about this in my um uh in YouTube the video that i made about the tower pardon <laughs> i was like youtube channel link in bio yeah yeah yes um so i made a i made a video about the <laughs> so uh the tower of babel and i talk a little bit about this um what i think is happening i think the the story is original to Nabonidus, um, the the one that's that's in Daniel four, the one that is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I think this is this is at the heart of it, and that the writer of Daniel is the one who replaced Nabonidus with Nebuchadnezzar. And I think one of the reasons for that is just because of a like at that period of time we're talking. Well, I honestly, I don't even know. I think some of this stuff in, uh, I think the Aramaic stuff in Daniel is is 
quite likely a, a fair bit older um, than the second century. Um, but uh, there, I, there seems to have been a movement at, at that time um, to connect uh, Nebuchadnezzar more with the failure in Babylon. And I think the reason for that has more to do with um, how, with how even the uh, the the Babylonian appraisal of Nabonidus turned out. So, in a sense, they're like instead of giving you know instead of giving uh, any outs to Babylon, like for having been you know because the running narrative is well, you know. Babylon was was uh, usurped by the Persians because um, Nabonidus abandoned Marduk. So instead of giving like any quarter uh, to this idea, I think uh, the Jewish scribes in Daniel are more like, no, 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 no. Uh, you know, even the great Nebuchadnezzar, the 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 greatest king in Babylon, was still under Yahweh's thumb, right? There's just no, you can't give any credit at all okay. to I can see that. even a hint of it, right? To, to Marduk. And, and I think too, like in my, in my video that I made about the Tower of Babel, I actually connect the, the story in the Tower of Babel to, to what's going on uh, in the exile. Um, and I think what happened is that during the exile there, there I, I think there there's there's possibly like an historical kernel here and we see some of this in jeremiah as well in jeremiah he he comes out and and he calls babylon he personifies babylon as as pride as arrogance and i think this was very much like a this was very much directed at specifically Nebuchadnezzar this is the 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 way that he's portrayed in the in the tales right in the in the Aramaic section of uh of Daniel there's a consistency here and um I I think there's possibly like a like a real world historical kernel there where these people living uh you know in Babylon in exile were like look at this guy this you know this this king who who has built this magnificent city um look look at how he's you know um i guess uh puffing himself up you know he almost thinks he's greater than 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 our god well we'll show him kind of thing i think that's that's more of what's what's at work here yeah because doesn't uh it doesn't nebuchadnezzar like uh, like brag consistently about how great he is uh, oh, prior yeah. to him going mad. Um, so it was yes, a tale of exactly. Yahweh. Yes, humbling. like that is that's what's at the, that's what's at the heart of of that particular story. He's literally he's walking around Babylon. He's looking around. He's going, "Wow, what a what a great place this is! Look at this yeah. city that I built. I look am the shit. Look, look, look at all look at all this. Look at everything I did." Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's actually, who, who I think that's actually, done this? exactly that. I think that's actually, that's, that's counter to the original, um, the original narrative framework of that story that at once featured Nabonidus. Uh, you know, we, we don't, we don't have that narrative framework. What we do have is the prayer because like, um, as it reads in Daniel four, there's this narrative framework of, of Nebuchadnezzar, um, you know, getting all, uh, getting all prideful about, uh, about the city and all the wonderful things he's done. And then God strikes him down and, and, and with madness and he ends up eating grass for like seven years. Right. And then after seven years, when he comes to his senses, the first thing he does is he utters this, this prayer of contrition and the prayer of contrition in Daniel is set in the first person. It's like I, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, um, came and, and and came to realize basically how great God is and what a you know what a what a pathetic creature I actually am. Um, so what we have in the prayer of Nabonidus is just 
like that part where it's like I Nabonidus, you know, but but for him, he was like he was sick, you know, he had an illness and uh, and the illness was wrought on by by some kind of personal shortcoming. He, he comes to to admit that and he is cured of this illness by a a Jewish prophet or a, a, a Jewish mystic. Um, th- who is this is, is the account think, of, of Nabonidus and the Dead Sea Scrolls? Nabonidus, about, yes, right? yes, and I think yeah. it's very telling that this Jewish mystic in the prayer of Nabonidus is not named, he's he's anonymous. So, you know, by the time yeah, we get in to the book of Daniel, yeah, it's, yeah. it's just Nebuchadnezzar having a, a change of heart miraculously, but in yeah. in the tale of Na- uh, Nabonidus, he's yeah, like you said, he's he's healed by a mm-hmm. uh, by a Jewish messianic figure, maybe not a messianic um, figure. So I he, think just a just a a, a Jewish because this was this. I think there's there's this popular th- th- this this idea was was sort of popular in the in the Persian period too of um, uh, Jews living internationally and interacting with with the uh with the great powers and uh you know being more clever than everybody else right so he's just a he's just a he's just a jewish guy who you know is exercising good judaism <laughs> and he's got this special connection right with with god so so you know he's able to uh i actually think like the message behind that is not like it, it's it's not at all messianic it's more like you're a Jew, so like you're just as special as this guy, and you've you've got the truth, and and you know you can actually go out there and and uh, show all these people uh, who who worship other gods and and who you know are who are wealthy and successful, um, even though uh, you're you're um, living out of the land, you're you're separated from from your home. Um, yeah, you, you have this power too. I kind of think there's, there's something of that in, in the heart of a story like the prayer of Nabonidus as well. So what, what do you think was the, uh, I, I think this is kind of the question I was trying to ask earlier and I couldn't quite get my words together. <laughs> what do you think was the motivation for replacing Nabonidus with Nebuchadnezzar? Like was Nebuchadnezzar a, a, a historic figure? That they sort of imprinted onto the story of Nabonidus. So I think it probably or, it yeah. probably has a lot to do with how how Nabonidus ends up becoming regarded, uh, just historically. Um, nobody likes this guy, right? After mm. after after his rule and after he's been he's been deposed, uh, the histories of Nabonidus are all unflattering. Um, and I think yeah. uh, this is this is sort of playing into this. Um, instead of like uh, a loser like Nabonidus, <laughs> let's put let's put the let's put the biggest gun we can think of in there. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar. There's no one bigger than him, okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. So because because Nabonidus wasn't wasn't walking around saying things that like um, Nebuchadnezzar was like. Yeah, right. Like, like you know, Nabon- he had the, he, had the just, he wanted to like, too. he just agreed with everybody. He was like, I want to worship the moon god, Sin. And then he yeah. left, and uh, everyone's like, hey, where are you going? Because the, the king at the time, he was responsible for directing the, the yearly festivals, the offerings that would yes. give up to the gods. Well, he wasn't yeah. there to do that. So no, people were exactly. complaining, like, hey, why did you leave us? So, oh, they all hated um, him. I didn't he leave like his, his son in charge, and that didn't go so yes. well or something. Yes. So he just, yeah, it just, just okay. a, just a, a, a disastrously bad, um, uh, administration. If the, if the critics are to be believed, right? Like, so, I mean, all the sources we have are, are, are deeply, um, invested in an ideology. So we have to be kind of suspicious about all of them, but everything we have, it's just Nabonidus is not not popular yeah nobody seemed to like him from what i've read no oh. <laughs> so so we're gonna you want to talk some more about uh about isaiah where do you want to start with this 
Um, I guess with your thoughts on, um, cause you mentioned, I'm, I'm trying to look over my notes here. Okay. Um, the chapter one st uh, starts with during the reign of Uzziah, um, mm -hmm. which is roughly dated again, like you said earlier, there's multiple sources. It kind of goes all over the place. It's roughly dated between 783 and 742 BCE. Okay. Um, and then, uh, but there, there's in, in chapter 36, again, that was chapter one. Chapter yeah. 36 refers to a later account. Um, uh, I just lost it. Yeah, the, it's dated to his death. To the death of Uzziah. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In 36, uh, the invasion of Sennacherib in 701. Mm -hmm. And then, sorry, my, my notes are all over the place. <laughs> kind of like Isaiah, right? Like even so, my, yeah, my, my feeble like attempt this, yeah. at simplifying Isaiah. So why don't we? Still, hey, like, why don't why don't we start? What was your um, <laughs> sorry, I just kicked my camera. Uh, why don't Why don't we start just by by kind of introducing uh, two people? What's going on here? uh with isaiah yeah. so um isaiah is is a um so it's not it it's one of the most highly and and has for forever it's always been one of the most highly regarded uh prophetic books hey, re real quick i need to do this to you guys i'm i need to use the bathroom i'll be I'll right back two seconds dr kip keep, keep right. going i'll be right back so it's always been regarded one of the most the the most it's always been one of the most highly regarded uh prophetic books in the hebrew bible and um it the whole book of isaiah as we have it comprises uh 66 chapters um now and and it, it purports to have been written and and based on the the oracles of a man by the name of uh, Isaiah ben Amotz. Isaiah, the son of Amotz, uh, who was appears to have been connected to the priesthood in the Jerusalem temple, as well as the royal administration, which is which is not unusual uh, throughout the history of Judah, and um, you know in in the. Uh, uh, throughout the the history of the davidic kingdom this is the the house of david uh the the kings of judah were always very closely connected to the temple as well as to the priesthood so right away the first thing you need to know is isaiah is connected to power uh he's he's probably wealthy he is a you know he's part of this this ruling establishment in jerusalem and uh, the text tells us that that he prophesied, or or he he, and he might have even been a court prophet, um, literally employed within the court of the kings of Judah as uh, a conduit, basically between Yahweh and the kings to ensure um, the 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 steady uh, rule of the kingdom and the the maintenance of what we call shalom, which uh you know we translate as peace but is really just the holistic well-being of all things um so this this is probably his job actually um he and he he did this through uh four administrations Uzziah uh Ahaz Hezekiah and uh, Manasseh um there's a much later uh legend that that Manasseh actually um executed isaiah there's virtually no historical merit uh to that um but uh yeah so this is who i isaiah is and the time period in which he lives during these these administrations of these kings is one in which um so it, at at this point in time this is the 8th century uh bce like the mid 8th century to the late 8th century around this time uh israel the or the northern kingdom israel or ephraim or even samaria or shechem as it's variously known uh is is 
larger and stronger than Judah at first, but very quickly um, they get involved in what's called the uh, the Syrah Ephraimite War. They they get involved with in a uh, dispute with with nearby Syria, um, and Judah they're they're trying to draw Judah into this conflict, and that's actually part of the uh, part of what's going on in the first part of Isaiah is Judah is is trying to negotiate their position in this Sarah Ephraimite war. They're, you know, they're Ephraim's allies, they're Israel's allies, but at the same time, I think there's some there is some some concern, political concern about uh, you know, the the ramifications of this. The Sarah Ephraimite war only lasts for a couple of years. Um, but very shortly after the Sarah Ephraimite war, what happens is the the Assyrians and I believe it's under Sennacherib. Uh, I, I might get that wrong, but I think it's Sennacherib. Uh, the king of the Assyrians starts a sweeping campaign down uh, south uh, into uh, the region of Israel. And he basically destroys uh, the kingdom. Uh, and as a result, uh, this, this has a huge effect on Judah because Ephraim, or sorry, uh, uh, Sennacherib, uh, exiles a bunch of the uh, the the leading citizens connected to uh, the administration in the north in uh, in Ephraim or or Israel uh, back to Nineveh, um, but then a whole bunch of people because the the kingdom is ruined and and destroyed, huge numbers of people uh, from the north start migrating south. Uh, they become refugees, basically coming into uh, the 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 land of Judah and what we see happening on a geopolitical sociological level is that the city of Jerusalem itself experiences like this enormous growth it experiences like this this population explosion kind of right around the the end of the rule of of Ahaz but certain or sorry no right around the uh, the rule of Hezekiah there's like this enormous increase in population and as and because also of uh, of this uh, this power vacuum that's that's been created a little bit with the uh, destruction of the northern kingdom, Judah benefits from that. Jerusalem starts to become much more uh, economically strong. Uh, and here is where there's all, all these interesting little prophecies sort of sprinkled throughout uh, chapters 9, uh, 8, 9, and 10 in particular. 11 too, I think in Isaiah, which reflects this, 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 you know, idea of there being almost like a, like a, a hope for a new united kingdom, uh, just like in the old days under, under, uh, David and Solomon, this new united kingdom. And where this comes from is this massive influx of, uh, refugees from the North coming into, uh, the city of Jerusalem. This time period is also really interesting too, because scholars were, will point to this migration uh, south in the eighth century as the time when lots of the the traditions of the Hebrew Bible in the Torah start to get combined. Like the Northern Kingdom has their own writings, all really? about uh, you know their their own Yahwistic writings and their own history that's distinct from the what's in the Southern kingdom. And, and this is when they start to come together and they start to uh, fuse these stories and, and create kind of almost like a new uh, national nationalistic epic. So that's what's going on. And this, this dominates uh, the content of Isaiah basically from chapter one all the way through are certainly up to chapter 33 and then it gets kind of fuzzy from chapter 34 through chapter uh 39 there's there's like a narrative section from chapter 36 to 39 which basically is a it is it is just pulled verbatim out of uh out of second kings like it's the exact same text um yeah and uh what scholars tend to see is that the the, the book of Isaiah proper, the prophecies of Isaiah, uh, it ends at this point. It's just contained within at least certainly the, the first 33 chapters, but also possibly uh, chapter 35. 
Um, and then there's this narrative conclusion, right? This is fairly common. You see this in something like the book of Jeremiah as well, right? There's lots of prophecies and then it ends with, with like this narrative conclusion uh, regarding uh, the, the destruction of Jerusalem much later. So, you know, the, the thought is that this is what this book once looked like. So now at some point, hundreds of years, or I guess it's about a hundred years later, uh, long after Isaiah, long after Hezekiah, um, you know, the, the, the city of Jerusalem, the kingdom of Judah, um, starts to feel pressure. The, the Assyrian kingdom, um, gets, uh, overtaken by the Babel, the, the, uh, the Babylonians, what, what we call the, the, the Neo Babylonian kingdom under Nabopolassar, uh, whose son was Nebuchadnezzar the son, right? And, yes. uh, what's that? I was like, yeah, that I was alluding to that earlier. Keep, keep going. Yeah. Loving this. So, yeah. So they start, they, they basically take over, um, all of all of Assyria's holdings, and then they start uh, coming down uh, themselves down the south coast, uh, down the coast uh, south towards Egypt, which brings them uh, through Jerusalem. And this is during the rule of uh, Jehoiakim. And uh, at this time, this is where when the prophet Jeremiah is active. Um, so we see a lot of this stuff uh, uh, in uh jeremiah's writings uh so nebuchadnezzar comes down he basically to make a long story short he uh besieges the city of jerusalem he eventually uh enters the city uh he exiles again the the king and and all the leading citizens and he installs a puppet monarch um uh zedekiah and uh he he's in in control for three years and then very unwisely decides to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar has to come back, besieges the city again. And this time he's not fucking around. He like mm. comes in and he like raises the city. He destroys the temple. He uh, executes all of Zedekiah, whose sons, and then he gouges Zedekiah's eyes out and takes him back with him uh, to Babylon. So, and now there's a huge population of uh, these, these these Jews, these Judeans, right. living in Babylon. And they start writing, they start reflecting. As you mentioned, they start reflecting back. They're like, wow, the prophecies have failed. The something that was very important to the ruling establishment in Jerusalem was this idea that that the the kingdom of David specifically, uh, would was like a was like a, you, an everlasting kingdom, right? And then that came to an end. Uh, and now they're grappling with with why and what's going on. And so they start writing somebody or a group of people start writing these beautiful poems um, that basically reflect on this this new idea about a remnant coming out of this small group in Babylon and basically. Uh, replacing yes. the old Israel, right, and and becoming kind of like the new nation, but it's a it's it's a much more touchy feely uh, uh, kind of hope. It's it's and, and it has has a more global uh, perspective. Uh, we call these poems uh, the servant songs, and they are in Isaiah chapter forty through through uh, chapter fifty four. And one of the features of the servant songs is that Israel as a nation, and then possibly, you know, this remnant of uh, of Jews uh, are personified as a servant who suffers on behalf of not just the nation, but like the whole world uh, for for the the failings of the old kingdom, and and there's restoration. <laughs> and hope through this new community right so um that's the, the this section from isaiah 40 to 54 scholars are unanimous they agree that it was written during the babylonian exile by you know somebody or multiple people of this this community now 
I'll just I'll finish up with this. Uh, eventually, uh, after about 55 years or so, Cyrus, the king of Persia, we've talked a little bit about this already. He um, the overthrows the, the kingdom of Babylon, specifically Nabonidus, <clears throat> who, you know, uh, uh, historians everywhere from the period agree was a terrible ruler. Um, and so Cyrus comes in and he uh, sends uh, delegates from this Jewish community living in Babylon back to Jerusalem, specifically to instill like a like a Persian style government and to rebuild the temple, <laughs> um, it, you know, as as their goal. But this is all like this is all about about very clever Persian accommodation and and just uh, you know good administration. He's he's you know doing Cyrus is doing his best to ensure that he he maintains you know control and and does a very very good job of this. So. Uh, the Jews come back now to Jerusalem, and then there's in this section at the end of what we now have is the book of Isaiah from chapter 55 to 66, uh, there's a new voice. And we know it's a new voice because while this, this new voice is writing, we see that worship has been restored in the temple. And it's been restored in the temple because they rebuilt the temple. And it it sort of echoes some of the same messages from second Isaiah. There's these messages of hope for a future and this, this global um, yeah, kingdom of God idea. Yeah. So, so this is kind really? of like just a basic snapshot of what the book of Isaiah looks like. Um, one thing I need to point out is I, I need to constantly uh, keep coming back to this is this is not a nefarious thing. These were not, um, so the prophets who were, or, or the people who were writing this stuff later, uh, were not pretending to be Isaiah. That's not what they were doing. They're anonymous. Yeah. Um, and they're speaking anonymously. What happened was uh, there was probably a school or, or a group who collected specifically Isaiah's prophecies who was also part of this same group and just decided let's all put, let's just put them all together. Right. Um, let's put them together. They recognize these are not the same. Like these are not the same prophecies. They don't belong to the same guy, Isaiah. So, you know, which is why they never attempt to attribute them to him. They're just collecting them in the same scroll. And this is nothing new. Like we see this, uh, the uh, the so-called minor prophets, the the twelve minor prophets in the Hebrew Bible, were collected together. All the manuscripts that we have have all these prophets collected together. It's the same thing taking place in Isaiah. This is just a a scroll collecting the writings of a group of prophets, of which Isaiah happens to be one, the most prominent and the only one who's named and identified. So. He's the one who gets his name on the book. It's it's pretty much as simple as that. Sorry, was there, there a there's a. Cat? Oh yeah, it was just just Derek fucking around. We don't gotta worry about him. Oh, <laughs> at least he's watching. So at least you're watching, Derek. There it is. Yeah, maybe you'll learn something. Uh, yeah, it's there's oh, a scholar. Wow, I can't I can't remember his name now. It's remarkable when you when you say things like that how similar the Old Testament is to the New Testament. So like when you say these are all a collection of prophets that were put together on a single scroll, there's a scholar that thinks uh, the same thing about. And if anyone in the chat can knows what I'm talking about, please let me know. Uh, there's a scholar that thinks uh, all Paul's letters were treated the same way. Like everything Paul ever wrote was put together on one scroll. And then later scribes started dividing them and attributing them to different churches. Um, that's just what that reminded me of. Hmm. Um, okay. So I, I, I had one question. Uh, yeah, sure. This is for me. And I got another question I'm going to ask you. Uh, what do you think was Cyrus's, you touched on this a little bit. What do you think was Cyrus's goal in allowing the Jews to return? Was he just trying to keep the peace or did he see some sort of value in sort of recruiting them or rubbing elbows with them. Uh, what do you think he had to gain by doing that? Because it, it didn't seem like he had much reason to. 
Yeah, but look at what happened in Babylon. So what does Cyrus do to ensure that that he is able to 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 wrest control and maintain it in this very very important city in Babylon? What he does is he he makes sure that he honors these people's deeply held religious traditions. He gets mm. right in close with the priesthood. He's like, look at me. I'm a Mardukian. I worship Marduk. Marduk <laughs> actually speaks to me, right? Mardukian. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Did they, maybe, yeah. uh, I like it. Yeah. Let's so, it. I. That this is so it is it's it's very I think it's calculated I think it's very very smart and I think he's doing the same thing with the Jews he's like okay I've got this like I've got this little outpost um you know on the it, it's an important like, like it's an important trade route the geography here um really contributes to this like uh Babylon is to the uh, east of uh, almost straight east of where Jerusalem is but between Babylon and like Judah and Jerusalem there's like this huge desert this wilderness you can't cross it yeah uh back then there's no way you could get across it it just you, you it was suicide so you had yeah. to go north around and then you had to come south uh down the coast uh, so the only way like to get from Babylon to Egypt, which was still an enormously important center of culture and, uh, and, and part of the economy, the only way to get there is to get, is to go through basically, uh, you know, the, the Levant Judah. Uh, so Cyrus is looking, he's like, okay, so there's this. There's this uh, this this city that Nebuchadnezzar basically just just demolished. Um, what if I put like a garrison there to help to ensure that I control this trade route? Um, now there's already a whole bunch of people who live there, um, and these people uh, are. You know, they're they're a mixture of these 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 Canaanites who worship, you know, the gods Baal and Asherah and and El. But there's a whole lot of people in Gagon this area and, who also, yeah. yeah, there's a whole lot of people in this area who also worship this god Yahweh. I have got a bunch of these people in my city here, this this new city of Babylon that I've just that I've just occupied, they also worship Yahweh. So why don't I send them back with like my edict and, and my instructions hey, and also promote myself as a follower of Yahweh, as somebody who's sympathetic to their cause. I'll give them money uh, to, yes, please rebuild my city, but also, yeah, sure. Build a temple, build a temple there to, uh, to Yahweh. Some scholars have suggested actually that um like really the entire the entire legal code that appears pretty much in the in the Torah is in large part a Persian invention um and part of this this programmatic religious uh um um effort of uh, pacification I don't know about that. I I I think there's there's a I I yeah, I, I mean I think there's a lot more, you know, deeply embedded within the history of of this region uh religiously. Um but I think there's something to this idea that Cyrus sent these people back to Judah as as a way of of ensuring his his control there and I have no doubt that they brought with them mm -hmm. uh, Babylonian and, and Persian ideals that they've adopted and now uh, syncretized into their, you know, older religion. Does that make sense? 
No, yeah, it does because it, it, they did that previously to the Babylonian Empire or the uh, Babylonian exile and their reintroduction into the kingdom of Cyrus the Great. Um, yeah, yeah, they, they were constantly. <laughs> I made a joke on Twitter a little is, while back, and I was like, I, "I'm blown away at the the amount of impact trade routes had on the oh. developmental on the development of theology. Like it, it all was a, it was all about trade routes. That's how it all ha happened, you guys. It was trade routes. That's how we got God today. That that's where the Christian God comes from. Trade routes. You, you don't understand." <laughs> Anyway, I mean, he's got a point. Um, <laughs> no, there's a lot more to it than that, but dude, just when, yeah. when you read into it, it's like, yeah, and then these people conquered this land because it was ideal for trade routes. And then these people conquered yeah. this land uh, and it was close to water, which made it ideal for trade routes. And, and then yeah. these, these other people migrated through there and we met them. And we're like, hey, these are my ideas. Uh, your ideas sound cool. Let's just mesh them together. And hey, Jesus, that's that's in a nutshell how exactly how the yep. shit all started. <laughs> um, I had a question from a friend of mine before I okay. go off on another tangent. Uh, this is from Imus. Uh, you spoke about areas where Q and the Masoretic text have a lot of discrepancies between them. I've noticed it's at the junctures we see a large volume of. Hapax legomenia. Um, Hapax legomenia. Is yeah. this Zip's law at play? Sorry, I'm. This is from Ima. She's my linguist friend. I, okay. I don't know how to pronounce? And this. I don't know. I'm. <laughs> uh, this is bad. I like. I'm not a linguist, so I don't. I don't know Zip's law. So I'm. I wish I could answer the question about whether or not this is this is Zip's law at play i don't know i'm sorry and i'm not going to pretend to know unlike some people on uh youtube um hey yo uh, well, shots I, fired what's that <laughs> nothing you know nothing at talking. all you know Keep who going. you are you know who you are um so i wonder is this um do you think this is this is a question that stems from my um my dead sea scrolls video where i talked about the uh the great Isaiah scroll and some of the differences we see there. I uh, think so actually. actually. Okay. Um, discrepancies be though. Notice that these junctures, we see larger volumes of Hapax legomena. Interesting. I have not noticed that, but now that you mention it, uh, that does That's... pique my interest. So see, I, I must have told you, you, you something... underestimate yourself. Yeah, right. Uh, so uh, maybe I should say something about this here. Uh, now, one of the neat things and something I, I talk about in my video, everyone should go and watch my my Dead Sea Scrolls videos. Uh, the first one's kind of a, just a basic uh, introduction to the series. Um, the second one is squarely focused on the Isaiah Scrolls from Cave One. There were 22 copies of Isaiah discovered in what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. Two of them came out of the first cave. They were the among the first discoveries. Uh, the one everybody knows, which is called the Great Isaiah Scroll, is a completely intact copy of the Book of Isaiah. It uh, uh, measures 10 meters or 24 feet. Um, and contains the entire book from chapter 1 to 66. Um, it is on display. No, sorry, it's not on display. There's a replica on display at the Shrine of the Book, but I've actually been inside the vault with it, uh, working on it because i'm special it's all replica um, at the the uh, bible museum in dc yeah sure yeah they've got one too those replicas are expensive um they look really good like, it was very convincing it it is it is top notch uh but they paid like fifty thousand yeah. dollars for that for three replicas for, for a replica of that the habakkuk commentary on one qs uh i think it was one qs Anyways, so the other, the it other, uh, Isaiah know scroll, what doing. yeah, <laughs> the other, the other, uh, scroll of Isaiah from cave one is this one here. Um, this is otherwise known as one QS or sorry, one Q 
Isaiah B. And this is the uh, the nerdy stepchild that nobody talks about, um, which is weird because it's a lot more fragmentary than the great Isaiah scroll. But the weird thing is this is actually the one that looks very, very much like the Masoretic text, like the standard text of the Hebrew Bible, whereas 1Q Isaiah A, the great Isaiah scroll, is ha, contains tons and tons and tons of uh, textual variants, over 2,600 uh, to be precise. So um, one of the things about the great Isaiah scroll, which is really interesting, is that, and I, I, I make a point of this in my uh, video, I say... Hebrew. In 1Q Isaiah A, uh, in addition to these uh, 2,600 textual variants, there are also seven um, what what the editors called large insertions. Uh, these are uh, large sections of text, like whole sentences, um, that were missing in 1Q Isaiah A, but are present. In the Masoretic text, the the standard text, oh, and, I see. right? Um, in the second half of Isaiah, and we should talk some about the second half of Isaiah in one Q Isaiah A. In the second half of Isaiah, what's happening is the scribe is writing, and then uh, comes to a point and and ends uh, like an oracle or a section, and then leaves a blank space. And then continues like a line below uh, with something new, but you know always missing this this chunk of text that you know appears in the Masoretic text. So uh, one of the editors, Eugene Ulrich, at first thought we have evidence here of this expansion, this expansive text in the Masoretic text, and therefore. 1Q Isaiah A is actually like an older form of Isaiah. Um, one of the things about uh, the second half is everywhere where one of these breaks occurs uh, where the Masoretic text is missing, a second scribe has come along and then added it, right? So mm -hmm. uh, there's a guy yep. who did his PhD at the University of Birmingham and he's currently now, I, I don't know if he's still working there. I know for he was for a while uh, working for the very interesting project, the hands that wrote the Bible at the University of Groningen. His name is Drew Longaker. I've heard and of that. I'm, yeah? Which, the, the project? Yeah, I think I have. Drew. The, the project. Yeah, no, it's a very cool like, project. Like, it's like, basically... It's it's using the the goal of the project is to use artificial intelligence as a means of identifying individual scribes uh, who wrote uh, yeah. the manuscripts in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's very very cool. I think That's the project has ended. It was uh, it was an ERC project, uh, European Research Council, which is a big deal. Um, oh. But I I think it has since ended. Anyways, there's a young guy uh, named Drew Longaker. Um, who wrote this uh, this excellent article? Um, my friend Matthew Monger, uh, some of your audience will know him as Dr. Moat, has joked with me that the amount of times that we, uh, for the amount of times that we pitch Drew's article, uh, we should be getting, he should be giving us something. <laughs> but, uh, but Drew wrote this really, really good article. Uh, it's the best thing he's ever written, um, all about uh, these these breaks, these section breaks in 1Q Isaiah A that have been filled by a second scribe. And he makes a very, very good argument for how what's actually going on here is the scribe who's writing the second half of Isaiah. Uh, and again, I think we should seriously talk about this, uh, the first half and the second half of 1Q Isaiah A. So the scribe who's writing this second half Please, of 1Q Isaiah A. What's that? I, I said, oh, please do. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so the scribe who's <laughs> writing this second half of Isaiah, um, he's using a manuscript of the second half of Isaiah separate 
from a manuscript of the first half of Isaiah. So, you know, these are right away, they're separate manuscripts. They're understood, you know, obviously by the, uh, the, the collectors to be separate compositions. Remember I, I said, they just, you know, second, third Isaiah is, you know, understood to be a, different from one QA, different from Isaiah, even though they're collected yeah. together. Here we have separate copies of, you know, one separate copies of Isaiah 1 through 33. And the scribe is using a different copy now for Isaiah 34 through 66, but it's a damaged manuscript. So damaged on the bottom. So that as he's as he's copying and he gets to the bottom and there's like stuff missing at the bottom. And he knows this because they they had a good sense of what the text said. So he's like going from memory here going, okay, so um, I actually have to leave some space here so that I or someone else could come back later and fill in the missing bits, right? Um, so he hmm. goes, he does this throughout, through the rest of this second half of 1Q Isaiah A. And then a third scribe uh, comes along and, uh, oh yeah. So it is actually a different scribe also writing this second a third scribe. from, yes. And this is one of the, one of the really cool things that was revealed by this project. The hands that wrote the Bible is that the uh, scribe writing the second half of one Q Isaiah a is different from the scribe writing the first half of one Q Isaiah a, but is trying to emulate the style of the first scribe, which I think is wild, yeah. right? So how did how do you um, think so the, now how, how do you think the AI picks up on that? I'm sorry, keep, keep how does the AI pick with your up thought? on that? Yeah. So I mean, we we can. I honestly, I don't understand it, but I I remember. Yeah, I'm sure that's uh, probably not, a not your area. <laughs> yeah. I sat through a presentation once uh, about this, and it's 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 way beyond me, but it, yeah, it was pretty cool. Like <laughs> but anyways, to... oh uh, yeah, um, that's why we get computers to do it because <laughs> we Keep can't. Okay, so uh, right. this this third scribe is filling in the the missing text that from the you know that that uh, they left space for. Um, and he looks like he's doing it from memory because uh, it's different. The stuff that he's filling in is different from the Masoretic text, but close. And there's several places where he's making mistakes as he's filling this in from memory, uh, which is, I think, very cool. And it and it says a lot um, just about the way quote-unquote scripture was handled in the first century BCE. It says a lot about how scribes went about and did their work. And I think it says a lot also about how confident we can be in, you know, the quote-unquote accuracy of these texts stretching backwards. Hmm. Yeah, it's like uh, like we were talking about earlier. There's um, b b very basic rudimentary stuff. The there's a difference between first Isaiah and second Isaiah. Second Isaiah is kind of, or at least used to be, uh, believed to start in verse four or chapter forty. But that's still the majority. Uh, they discover, it still is okay. Good. Um, yeah. And then, like, uh, people started discovering that chapters 34 and 35, I think, have very similar yeah. tone and structure to Isaiah yeah. 2, which isn't supposed to come until later. Yeah. So now yeah. people are trying to, like, figure, like what, what's going on? Is, is there a scribe that's trying to mimic the style <laughs> of second Isaiah and insert his opinion, will, what have you, into first Isaiah? What Like, what's what's going on here? Yeah, I'm not, not asking you specifically. See, the, saying, no, no. But see, this, this is, is where I like to. I when I, when I talk about first Isaiah, I like to I like to talk about Isaiah one to thirty three, and when I talk about second Isaiah, I like to talk about forty to 
to 55 and all that stuff in the middle i'm you know i i think it could be the product of a yeah. variety of things we just don't know yeah. right 33 um, to 40 is where the contention is among scholars that's where all yes. the scholars are like getting in and fucking fighting each other like yeah. that's where it's all happening everything else yes. they pretty much agree so, with each other on but um, these few i will say one thing what what certainly seems clear is that the whoever wrote whoever copied 1q isaiah a the great isaiah scroll understood uh chapters 34 through 39 to belong to second isaiah right mm. um and my so my dr father uh my phd supervisor his name is uh george j brook at the university of manchester his doctor father um his phd supervisor was william s brownlee who taught at claremont graduate school in uh, southern california and uh william s brownlee was also uh one of the two um post doctors who were stationed at the uh american school for oriental research in east jerusalem uh on the day <laughs> that uh mar athanasius samuel the owner of the great isaiah scroll brought the scroll for the first time to the american school of oriental research uh he's actually looking for uh professor millard r burroughs who happened to be away in iraq on an archaeological dig so he wasn't there and the only two guys who were there kind of kind of looking after the place were william s brownlee and um another uh postdoctor by the name of john treffer these young guys who had just finished their phd and are working at what we call asor the american school for oriental research so uh they were the first uh western academics to see a dead sea scroll of any kind and it was 1q isaiah a um and william s brownlee uh had this really interesting <laughs> You said they were first year. Did you say first they were year? first year postgraduate? They were, po or? no. So they were, they're, they're, they're postdoctors. Like when you finish your PhD quite Post often, you'll do. Okay. Okay. I was yeah. About to say. So you do, you'll do like a, like a right. research um, stay. Right. So that's what they're doing. They're, they're PhDs. Um, but uh, gotcha. William Brownlee had this this i i think this is a this is a pretty great idea whereby he 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 suggested a structure uh specifically just for the great isaiah scroll and suggested that this is how jews from the period conceived of the differences between first isaiah and second and third isaiah uh where he aligned uh first isaiah to basically chapters 1 through 33 to quote unquote second third isaiah from 34 to 66 according to seven uh major major themes and uh, and it's a pretty nice uh little outline um i quite like it uh i present it in uh in my video offhand i would actually have to find the article here to to um recall exactly uh what what uh, video what did you each... cite that in it's in it's in my isaiah scrolls video which was the last one that i published the one you just uh, made the dead sea scrolls unapologetically 1.2 yeah so oh, but I it's i i i like it because you know it's a it's a bit of an historical connection that i that i have <laughs> i have some some uh Gotcha. Yeah, I, I, I have a connection to it. So, yeah, but uh, yeah, so right. like this, this great Isaiah scroll is, is, is very, very interesting for, I think in particular for, for this reason that it was obviously understood by the scribes to be uh, two compositions, uh, something like a first Isaiah and a second Isaiah, that the scribe who copied the scribes who copied them were using two different manuscripts to copy them and then a, a third scribe was was like 
fixing the mistakes and and adding missing text but then doing so from memory and in such a way that that uh created additional textual problems so i know we were supposed to talk about <laughs> about the apex legomena but i don't know anything about no, that i'm sorry and and now i'm like i'm really okay intrigued because that, that i awesome. think this is what she's getting at here that in these sections and maybe that's part of why there's all I think these Apex legomena in there right. because because the scribe is like doing this just from memory right and 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 again oh, i can't yeah, help but make these sure. connections to like uh the the new testament because we have accounts uh in the new testament where scribes are seem to be working from two different manuscripts and they have like a word that one manuscript has a word and the other manuscript has a different word so the scribe has to like decide which one he wants to go with and whatever one he goes with is the one that gets passed on yeah uh, right so yeah, yeah. It, it, that's just like the the, the <sighs> scribal <sighs> scribes recording text is nuts y'all it's there's so much to it it's not straightforward so, at all there, there are there I... are at, at cases there are people who are educated and know there's difference between uh someone copying a text and a scribe recording there's a huge difference at times there are people who um are slaves and it's part of their daily chores to write this text down these slaves may not even be able to write their own name but they're given the task by their slave owners you have to copy this down they don't know what the fuck they're doing they, they just write what they see and what happens is they mistake characters they spell things wrong it, it's just i can't even begin to Sorry, Dr. Kip. You seem like you had something you wanted to say. There. Yeah, yeah. I want. I'd like to say something about this because this, this like, like fits right into uh, uh, one of the things that I that I do um, well. Uh, so, within Jewish manuscripts, certainly, and these are these are manuscripts that um, were produced during the Second Temple period and then uh, forward through the medieval period by um by jews um within within jewish manuscripts and i think within jewish scribal culture uh what i like to talk about um is certainly uh actually let me just grab a book here. sorry go for it i've got a book here um and uh i i like to talk about um four levels of uh literacy if i can find this uh mm. da, 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 da. sorry just just give me a second here uh captain dab yeah go ahead you, is that referring to like there there are people who can read but can't write there are some people who can write but can't read there's some people who who can read but can't write their own name or like yeah, there are. It's there yeah. Are so this is this is to literacy in the ancient world. Like today, you're yeah. you're either literate you know or what? not. But in the ancient can world, I just, there is a spectrum. God, can I, I'm just wondering if maybe the maybe the best thing to do here is just to read uh, some of this. Go. So this yeah. is actually from an article that I wrote uh, called oh, "Shameless Plug." Yeah like it what well, shameless plug uh and i don't think you can buy it anymore because this is in the uh this is in the uh the discontinued volume of the uh uh, uh dead sea scrolls oh, no. the Museum of the bible right so but this article i it, i think it's a pretty good article um is called paleo uh paleographical and physical features of the dead sea scrolls in the museum of the bible collection a uh, synopsis and i i provided this little excursus here which is about two pages uh a note on scribal on scribalism in early jewish palestine so uh I just make a point here. Clear definition of our terms must be added here in an effort to provide an accurate reflection of scribal culture in ancient Judea. It has commonly been assumed in the past that the most skilled scribes 
were also the most erudite scholars of the era. There is understandably some truth to this notion in that it correctly posits a direct connection between pedagogy or education and literacy in Judaism and also between the presence of scribal schools and the power structures in the palace and the temple. However, studies of ancient pedagogics and scribal cultures also suggest that this is an oversimplification of the situation. We know that ancient Judea was largely illiterate, almost entirely so. Nevertheless, yeah. economics required the existence of a documentary scribal guild, even outside of the elite royal and temple circles. The massive finds of texts in the Judean desert beyond Qumran, including the Bar Kokhba ref refuge caves, attest to the existence of a parochial aristocracy not directly connected to the royal and priestly centers, which nevertheless supported a range of written production. Under these conditions, it is possible that most scribes were actually not highly trained scholars. Rather, as members of a professional guild, they would have been commissioned to write and copy any number of texts from simple documents to yep. expensive and exquisite literary works. While these professional scribes could also have been scholars, this was not necessarily the case. One recognizes the hand of a scholar by its confident fluidity and efficiency, often in combination with its rather arcane content. These are not the scripts appearing in the expensive trophies of literature. They are rather the utilitarian and functional products of the research and study of those otherwise engaged in contemplative enterprises about the mysteries and wonders of the world. The writing of scholars in Greco-Roman manuscripts is easily identifiable as the ex uh, expediently penned notations or scribbles, which appear qualitatively different from the ornate script common to deluxe editions that housed large uh, compositions. While the marginalia, that's the stuff in the margins, of this sort uh, that we see in these manuscripts collected by uh, E.G. Turner in his Greek manuscripts of the ancient world, are not extant in the Judean scrolls. There are a handful of analogous instances, such as the long insertion, of Jeremiah 729-83 that appears in the intercolumnar and the bottom margin of Forky Jeremiah A. This is a manuscript from about 250 BCE. In this particular manuscript, the added text is penned by a highly skilled vocational hand and is probably not a scholarly notation like those that we see. However, there are a number of scrolls from Qumran caves containing confidently written cursive scripts or those that have been described as semi-cursive and which could qualify as scholars' copies of texts according to this model of classification. And then I provide some examples here, such as uh, copies of for, First Enoch in 4Q201, or the so-called Aramaic Apocalypse in 4Q245, the Apocryphon of Levi in 4Q540, uh, the Testament of Kahat in 4Q542, or the copies of the Visions of Amram in 4Q546 uh, and 47. So among the Hebrew manuscripts from Qumran that fit this classification are copies of the community rule. Several copies of the community rule look like this, and also a copy of the Damascus document. So the point here being that when we're uh, analyzing and we're assessing, you know, who's writing what, um, usually the very, very fine scripts that look professional and easy to read, uh, these are, you know, these are, are copied by people who are part of this scribal guild whose job it is just to, just to copy text. And you're absolutely right where I think, I think it's probably too far to go that they, they, they couldn't write their own name. I think they probably, most of these people probably could, but um, the That's point fair. here is that they couldn't, they couldn't read or compose, right? In in the way that we imagine highly literate people do so today, all they could do was recognize letters and write them neatly and carefully, and no doubt they recognized lots of words too. 
but stringing them together in a sentence and actually, you know, reading the stuff or then even producing their own thoughts for like putting pen to paper and, and basically the, uh, um, pouring out their own thoughts. This is probably beyond most of these people. We see other manuscripts in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which looks, they, they look sloppy by comparison. And one of the reasons they look sloppy by comparison is because the, the scribe is writing fast. Like he's, he's clearly just zipping through this. Right. And yeah. you know, it, it, and it, and it's closer to like the, the difference between handwriting and, and printing. It's a what we call a cursive or a semi-cursive script. I would actually suggest, no, no, these are the guys who are, you know, the highly intelligent. These are the 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 uh, intellectual elite who are composing literature, and and this is what we see is it it, it comes out also in the types of text that they're producing too. Lots of this stuff that tends to be get really really heady or esoteric or or complicated. You know, they're also written with these kinds of of free flowing, confident, uh, but not especially uh, uh, legible in or or polished, I should say, in the same sense as as what we call like a, a bookhand. So I don't know. It's I think it's a it's a really neat distinction. So. Uh, all that to say, uh, for for a, for a manuscript like One Q Isaiah A, certainly One Q Isaiah B was written by a professional scribe. One Q Isaiah A, I also think was was most likely written by a professional scribe. But I think the the guy who had to come along and and fill in the blank spaces where the mistakes were made was more likely of these scholarly yeah. types, right? Gotcha. Yeah, I was like the line like pen of scribes. Sometimes. Sorry, I'm sorry. Lady Lady Wasser said Lady Wasser mentioned the line yeah, pen I... of scribes. Do you recognize this? This is uh this is Jeremiah chapter seven. He uh he goes on a rant <laughs> about about scribes. Yeah, he literally right? calls the shit out. Good, good. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Good so, reference, oh, Lady Wasser. Beautiful. Um, yeah, like, like I was saying uh, earlier, or in the way you just alluded to, is sometimes like we had these like slaves who were semi-literate, and it was part of their job to yeah uh, copy this copy this manuscript, and then you can go home to your wife and family, or sleep, or eat, or whatever. But you have to you have to finish copying this first. So they would kind of quickly like yeah, just fucking. We did the same shit when we were you know in detention in high school. Copy yeah. this, and then you can go home. That's exactly yeah. what they did back then. It is literally no different. Uh, so I think it, that's I, why we I don't see, know I, like. Good. I I don't know about I. I I think what, what you're talking about probably more 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 clearly reflects uh, the situation throughout the Roman Empire. Um, I don't know about I, I think yeah, in, that's in Judea I... most most scribes got paid, um, and it was probably a a a, a well respected oh, really? profession. I think so. Um, it was it was highly sought out. Like the stuff that they had to make too. Like these something a manuscript like like one Q Isaiah A or one Q Isaiah B was expensive. So I can see that because um, there's no uh, reference to slaves copying these manuscripts like there is uh, for the New Testament. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. sorry. So, but it it is all like all this stuff is is very very important for uh, for like people to to keep in mind as they as they think through and as they read through uh these these texts which were like supposedly inspired by god or or, or passed down by by divine mandate it's the the situation is way way more complicated and and interesting yeah yeah it's like it's when we talk about again going back to just my what I know the best with the New Testament manuscripts, yeah, um, 
between the first and third century, there are so many varying, uh, the manuscripts are very, very different between the first and third century. There's not a lot in the first, there, there, there's none in the first. Between the second and third century, the manuscripts that we have are, are very, very different. And then you get yeah. to the mid third century, then the manuscripts start seeming are, are more uniform. That's because that's when Constantine conquered Rome and he hired professional scribes. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between being literate and being an educated scribe. Absolutely. Prior to the mid third century, all you had was just people who were literate. Those were the ones who were copying the manuscripts. Again, like I was saying earlier, the scribes. But after that, now we have professional scribes. Uh, and But they're only copying the material that they had to work off of, which was 150 years of not professionally trained scribes yes. copying these texts. Yeah. So you see them like copying you know, a similar mistake. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, I, I was I was going to say you reminded me of something because because this is a little bit similar to like like we see something uh, somewhat similar going on in this period in which the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, were written and collected, whereby uh, there's a transition. I think there's a clear transition taking place from this more um, free flowing uh kind of uh scribal culture to something that is also uh becoming more standardized i mentioned it this is another i'm, I'm just all about plugging my my written works today uh so this is hey, are, are, are we back hello sorry i, I lost connection for like 10 seconds uh -oh. there, i think can you hear me yeah we're, we're back now but Oh, okay. My screen froze for like, yeah, ten uh -oh. seconds. Okay. But so we're, we're I now, um, so keep doing, I guess. This is this is another uh short article that I wrote um in uh oh where is it uh yeah okay this is it I think in this book uh this is the uh the scoring collection um. Mm -hmm. Artifacts in Dead Sea Scrolls. I wrote this article here. Uh, high quality scrolls uh, from the Herodian period or post Herodian period. Oh, that um, good. And basically, what I it's it's just a short little article, um, and it's uh, it's one of my more cited articles actually too, which is good. Um, but it uh, basically in an, I argue that based on the evidence that we see. Um, at Qumran, at Murabad, at Nahochever, at Masada, all these places where they found uh, Judean manuscripts, there appears to be kind of this transition where um, there be things are becoming more standardized in terms of how a manuscript ought to look. So columns, which is like like a a, a scroll is you know a, they the scribe divides with a with like a dry pencil or or like a a knife kind of scrapes what we call dry lines on them to indicate you know your your column boundaries and then he writes inside those um so what we see is a is a stronger standardization towards narrower columns that are longer they're higher so like in the Dead Sea Scrolls, most manuscripts are measure, you know, between 20 to about 30 lines. Suddenly in the uh, post Herodian period and, and probably after the destruction of the temple, uh, you see manuscripts now much more and more being structured into like 50 lines per column. And they're oh. narrower, like they're not as they're not as wide, right? Uh, what I have identified yeah. as high and narrow columns. And interestingly, in these manuscripts, you also start to see uh, a greater emphasis on textual stabilization. There is almost all of them are, uh, you know, preserve the Masoretic text as opposed to uh, something that preceded it. But we see, I think we see some of this already starting to take place in the Dead Sea Scrolls from Qumran like this. Manuscript, this copy of 1Q Isaiah B, um, I made a point of noting 
in uh, and this is in my my the second video in my series, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls Unapologetically. I made a point of noting that uh, unlike One Q Isaiah A, where the columns are there's there's like only thirty lines per column in One Q Isaiah B, uh, there's fifty, or is it fifty two? Oh. And then and it's actually like a, a slightly shorter manuscript. Um, you know, it only measures, uh, I think, uh, uh, is it is it just over ten feet compared to? No, no, no. It's it's longer than that. So, anyways, it's shorter as a result because it's also like taller, right? But there is a what I'm I I make up I make this point uh, as a means to say that already like in this period we're starting to see this movement towards like these stricter rules uh this standardization for how to write a quote-unquote biblical manuscript and i think it's i i don't think it's an accident that this is taking place right around the time that the uh that the temple was destroyed and basically the uh the 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 Sadakai priesthood uh, effectively comes to an end. Oh no, that that makes a lot of sense. It really does. Yeah. Huh. Okay, I, I've got some things to think about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Sorry, we haven't talked no. a whole lot about it. But no, no, you're there. <laughs> this this. It's good stuff. I, it's it's bubble gum for the mind, I guess. Yeah. Um, lots to chew on. Uh, so we're coming up on an hour and forty minutes. Okay. Uh, just breaking out the whiskey here. Oh, you're just now breaking out the whiskey. I've, I've been. Yeah, I just finished my. I just finished my beer. The rum since an hour and before I'm, we started uh, the stream. I'm breaking out my what favorite Japanese whiskey. It's uh ja Nika. Yeah, Nika from the barrel. Nika from you had this? Oh no. It's good. I'm it's not a good. big whiskey fan. Oh, okay. Good. Well, this one this one tastes like you're chewing on oak barrels. It's great. <laughs> oh, I can get into that. I have this like uh yeah. when I everyone has a story similar to this. Uh, when I first started drinking, and I was, we'll say less than twenty-one years old, um, drinking monkey piss I got, and, and swill. I, I got the cheapest whiskey you can buy, yeah, uh, and I drank the whole thing and uh, threw up and passed out, and and oh. you know the the story everyone's had. It's Ever since then, the, the smell yeah. of whiskey just doesn't. It, yeah, uh, but I'm, yeah, I'm that was me and rum. that was me and rum for like the longest time. Yeah, so we're uh, like opposites. Yeah, yin and yang over yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, I, so I uh, it's funny you tell that my my wife and I went. Uh, my wife and I went went back to Calgary where uh, we used to live for New Year's uh, this year. Left the kids at home, and my uh, my second son asked me if he could have a bunch of friends over and, and have a little bit of a New Year's party. We're like, okay, just, you know, not too many people don't make a mess kind of thing. And when I came, when we came home, he uh, he gives me like this little bottle of uh, of Jameson. I'm like, what the hell is this? And he's like, oh, he's like, my friend James oh, no. was like, <laughs> he thought it'd be cool. And he bought this and brought it over. And, and he had like, like a glass or maybe two, and then he was just like, he was just like hurling all over the place. He couldn't stand it. So he he thought maybe you would like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh well, I got I got a I got a free bottle of of cheap whiskey out of it. I'm I'm not gonna complain too much. They didn't make a mess. I mean, so it's all good. Free is better than cheap, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I have a uh, <laughs> I have a TikTok. a TikTok. I wanted to see. All right. It is. Let's look Let me at get this. the reaction to this. I don't think I've yeah. ever seen you react to a TikTok. 
No, I'm That's not cool. on TikTok, but I might be changing that. Yeah. Maybe. I don't recommend it, honestly. There, there there's plenty of no. like no, like I content don't. potential. Like like yeah. I, I recommend it, but I also don't. But there's plenty mm. of like material to make content from. Okay. But it's also a frozen hellscape. <laughs> So well, it can't be like, all bad if, if that's where Michael Jones lives now. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm working on a video response to, to him. I've gone back and forth with him on TikTok a few times. And I'm, I'm working on a, a video script actually earlier today. Yeah, anyway, uh, just just watch this and, and okay, g- g- I'm, give I'm me your it. thoughts. <laughs> Has the text of the Torah changed over the years or are today's scrolls the same as the original? A kosher Torah scroll has 304,805 letters or about 79,000 words and is written by hand and copied from a source text one letter at a time. After a careful study comparing today's almost universally accepted standard text and orthographically compiled eclectic text that was created after painstakingly comparing five 500-year-old texts and a Torah scroll from the relatively isolated Yemenite community, researchers isolated a grand total of just nine letter discrepancies. What's more, those nine discrepancies were the Hebrew equivalent of the difference between how Americans and Canadians spell color, different, but ultimately meaningless. Compare that to the New Testament, which is about the same length as the Torah, but about 1700 years younger, and for most of its history safeguarded by a central governing authority like the Vatican. Scholars discovered about 200,000 variants in existing New Testament manuscripts, which represent about 400 variant readings that raise doubts about the textual meaning, 50 of which are of great significance. The point here is not to denigrate great Christianity, but to show the remarkable accuracy of the Torah's transmission. Has the text of the Torah changed over the years or are today's scrolls the same as the original? A kosher Torah scroll has 304,805 letters or about 79,000 words and is written by hand and copied from a source text one letter at a time. After a careful study comparing today's almost universally accepted standard text and orthographically compiled eclectic text that was created after You're painstakingly comparing five 500-year-old texts and a Torah scroll from the relatively isolated really only take me 20 researchers seconds. isolated a grand total of just nine letter descriptions discrepancies. What's more, those nine discrepancies were the Hebrew equivalent of the difference between how Americans and Canadians spell color, different, but ultimately oh, meaningless. Compare that to it's the New repeating, Testament, isn't it? which is about the same it's, length it, as the Torah, but about 1,700 loop, years they? younger, and for most of its history it? safeguarded by a central governing authority like the Vatican. Yeah, I think so. Scholars this, discovered this about 200,000 variants in existing New Chat? Testament manuscripts, which represent about 400 variant is, readings that raise doubts about the textual you? meaning. So and I'll be honest, I, I I like heard half of it because as he was talking, all I could think about was uh was like a Josh McDowell uh Torah scroll <laughs> presentation. <laughs> so like that's so accurate. Um yeah, yeah, isn't it? Uh so what's <laughs> what's happening here is and the the strong tendency is for in particular, Christian apologists, I suspect Jewish apologists are doing the same thing. Um, I, I expect that's probably a Jewish apologetic video. Um, what's happening sure is they're extrapolating backwards from the scribal conventions, which are in place uh, by the medieval period. Okay, I mean, we read about there are there are scribal rules and conventions mentioned in the mish it's either the it, i mm, is it the mishnah or is it the one of the talmudim and is it, there's an important difference here the mishnah is um you know said to stretch back to the first century uh you know it's problematic dating some of this stuff and yeah, the it's... the talmudim are later right like these are like after well into the second century and beyond um you know our earliest our earliest textual evidence like our earliest manuscripts for the mishnah and the the talmudim and the tzefta are all like you know 12th 13th 14th century they're late um so but i i try i try to give them some benefit of the doubt um 
just to get uh, get into this a little bit. So um, sometime around the 5th or 6th century CE, right? So 500, 600 AD uh, was the time when the establishment of the Masoretic School happened. The Masoretic School is the one that eventually came to control the manuscripts of the Bible, essentially. Certainly the Torah, but of like the whole Hebrew Bible during the medieval period. These are the people who also developed the vowel pointings that now appear in all our Hebrew Bibles. Uh, so, but this is this is like 500, 600 AD, CE. Um, they're the ones who develop these rules about, you know, how to handle these manuscripts, how to copy them. They're the ones who develop the system for counting the letters to ensure that they were perfectly accurate. But there's no, these controls were not in place. You know, any time, as near as we can tell, they weren't in place prior to, you know, at least 500 AD. And what we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls absolutely destroys this idea because you see within the Dead Sea Scrolls, within just individual manuscript copies of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and then compared to uh, copies of, of uh, scrolls found in other sites, you see uh, a whole variety of just spelling conventions at work, you know, in terms of how they're they're writing the text. But something that kind of that that bothers me about this too, when you're when you're you're talking about the the literature of the Bible, uh, the Hebrew Bible, is that. The period we're talking about, the time of Jesus, thereabouts, and and a little before, there is no Bible. Like there are texts which we everyone has agreed there are texts which everyone views as authoritative on one level or another, and it seems mo it seems almost all Jews all Jews let's say regarded the Torah Moses as such that this was authoritative a scripture if you will. Um, they also had uh, a high view of uh, the so-called prophets, but not necessarily all of them. It seems like Jews sort of had their favorites. They're, you know, some liked Isaiah, some liked Ezekiel, some, you know, the yeah, people who wrote and collected the Dead Sea Scrolls had no interest in like first and second Kings, right? No interest. They just didn't care. Yeah, that's um, true. Are you going to call that scripture? Wow. Probably not. I, I, uh, I, and then it gets even worse for what we call the the Ketuvim or the writings, which include things like the Book of Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Ruth, uh, Daniel. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, Ecclesiastes. Th those lots of what's called the wisdom literature. So uh, and and it ran the gamut in terms of whether or not people thought these were were authoritative or useful. So the point I'm making is that right away the the situation at the time of Jesus is way more complicated. Uh, there wasn't just one scripture, and then they had all these different versions. You know, they had uh, what survived in the Masoretic text. They had what the greek translation the septuagint was translated from there was a hebrew there were hebrew texts behind those translations and lots of them are considerably different uh and then to make things even more complicated uh there are copies of texts from the dead sea scrolls that scholars uh still have difficulty even classifying as to whether they're quote unquote biblical texts or non-biblical texts just because they look like texts that we know from the Hebrew Bible, but are so different in terms of how they're yeah. written. So it just mm -hmm. like, it's just, yes, good, good for the Masoretes <laughs> for, you know, preserving the, the Hebrew Bible that they received, <laughs> you know, awesome. around the time of Muhammad. Way to go.
Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> Just wow. Um. <laughs> Just dude, it's it, it's so much to take in. I got a couple of uh, yeah comments that I saved uh, that we can answer real quick because okay. okay. uh, let's do it. Here we go. Okay. Uh, how reliable from Man Bear Big? How reliable is a Cyrus cylinder? Uh, and is it weird that it doesn't mention the Jews? Uh, does mention other people and nations? Oh boy. The, the Jews. Oh, I, I, I. So I don't know. Yeah, that's a sadly. That's I'm, a. Lot. I'm like I, but I, I. It's a really, it's a really interesting question, Man Bear Pig, and I, I feel. I feel shame for not knowing the answer. Um, but I, it's one of these things that maybe like, uh, this is certainly something I think I mentioned at the beginning that, uh, um, you know, I've got sort of in the works with, uh, Derek for myth vision of doing, uh, additional courses in the future. And maybe I'll do a course on Isaiah. I'm thinking about it, but it's certainly one of these things that Please, if I, I choose on. to do that, I <laughs> will, uh, I will find out. I will find out just how how great the Cyrus cylinder is. So stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> Again from Man Bear Pig. Do apologists like to yeah. prop up uh, I one Q Isaiah A over B just because it's the more impressive looking scroll? Yeah, we we talked about this yeah. a little bit earlier. Yeah. yeah. And I will say a little yes, bit more about this too. Like I think. I don't know if it's, I don't, I honestly think that most apologists just have no idea, right? This is just what they've been told. Um, and the reason being, when scholars, like, it, when scholars first found the Dead Sea Scrolls, when they first learned about them in 1947, and the first ones that they saw were 1Q Isaiah A and then 1Q Isaiah B uh, fairly shortly thereafter, uh, they were just right at the outset really excited about the fact that they've got uh these biblical manuscripts that are so goddamn old um i i think maybe i need to say something here just about like what the situation looked like prior to the discovery of the Please scrolls do. uh like the oldest the prior to the discovery of the scrolls in 1947 there were not many uh, there were almost no Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament dating from uh, prior to the medieval period. There was just a handful of little scraps here and there. The most famous and the and and the most um, important biblical manuscript at the time was something called the Nash Papyrus, which was discovered in the 1800s. And it's pretty small. It measures 20 centimeters by 10 centimeters. It's uh, a copy of uh, the Ten Commandments with bits of uh, Deuteronomy interspersed uh, throughout. So, I mean, this was like... Hey, Mr. Still, that's, that's the 18th history. century. That's yeah, so late. So, but this is... Uh, no, 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 no. It date, So it, it was discovered then, but it dates back to uh, about the second century uh, CE. Or, sorry, oh, oh, second oh, century yeah. BCE. Um I think I think it maybe is a little bit newer than that, but uh, so the, yeah, it it it's contemporary with the Dead Sea Scrolls, but this is prior to their discovery, and this was like the most of what they had. All of uh, our English Bibles and German Bibles and French Bibles and Spanish Bibles were translated from a manuscript called Codex, uh, sorry, the Leningrad Codex, which was a complete copy yeah, of the Old Testament in Hebrew, but it dates to 1009 AD. There is another codex that's a little bit older called the Aleppo Codex that dates, I believe, to the 900s, but it's not complete. There's a few folios missing from it. So, like, this is all you had. You had Greek translations of the Old Testament that date uh, earlier. You've got like Codex Sinaiticus and, and Codex Vaticanus from 
uh, the fourth century. You've got fragments, fragments of, of Greek uh, text that dates as far back, I believe, as 200 or even maybe 250 BCE, but they're small, right? So the situation was, yeah. was pretty bleak. So when they found Hebrew manuscripts yeah. that date back to like the first century BCE, and then they found a lot of them, and my God, one of them is a completely intact copy of the entire the entire book of Isaiah. This was like this was earth shattering uh, yeah. for the scholars working at the time. So I think right away this enthusiasm at the outset was all about just getting you know getting the text out there and you know seeing that by and large like this this great manuscript looked really a lot like um the masoretic text in, sitting in the uh in the aleppo codex and the and the leningrad codex so it took time like the edition, the the official critical edition of the Isaiah Scrolls was not even published until 2010. Okay? So I think what, what's happening is apologists just don't know this. They hear great Isaiah scroll, almost identical. This is this is the stuff that people were saying back in 1947 you know, 1950, 1955, after this stuff was first discovered. It took a long time for scholars to actually sit down and carefully, carefully study the manuscript and assess it against, you know, other copies. So all that to say, I, I don't think apologists are lying about this or, you know, just hoping that that no one will notice. I just actually think they don't even know. Um, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a big part of, they're just misinformed. And that's a big part of why I'm doing the series that I am is because I, I really want to correct a lot of this misinformation. I want people to gain clarity of what's actually in there. Um, so yeah, it, uh, it, it, it is kind of a, it is kind of funny that there is a manuscript. Oh, sorry. There is a manuscript. <laughs> one QIZAB is. that, that, you know, matches the claims or it much more closely matches the claims about stability, um, about this perfect, perfectly pre preserved text. But, uh, it's just, nobody knows. I mean, certainly no apologists or very few apologists even know this exists. Right, all they know yeah. about is Let the great Isaiah scroll. Study it in person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So hey, come here, my, from yeah, my... and I and I do think I will say I do agree that because one Q Isaiah A is such an impressive manuscript, it's it's yeah, it it uh, it dominates uh, people's thinkings about this stuff. Yeah. Um. Yeah, in in the Christian environment that I grew up in, I was heavily discouraged from studying the works of scholars. Um, nobody wanted me to. I, I I remember distinctly. I bought a book, and I like a bunch of us went to Barnes and Noble, and uh, I bought, bought a book, and I showed one of my spiritual leaders the book that I bought. I can't remember what it Do you was. Remember what the book was? What? I, I don't. No. I, I've been trying for like months to try and figure out what this book was. Um, but I showed it to one of the spiritual leaders. He was like, okay, maybe you shouldn't read this. And even if you do, keep in mind, this is a secular author. He's not going to be giving you the, the, the correct interpretation because he doesn't use the Holy Spirit. And at the time, I was young and stupid, and I bought into that. I was like, oh, wow, okay, I, I can't believe I just wasted my money on this. Oh, wow, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. That's, that's, that's Christian apologists now. They're yeah. like, yeah, don't, don't you know, read what the actual scholars who have looked at the Dead Sea Scrolls with their eyeballs 
and can translate it, don't don't listen to them. They don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, no, I I uh, <laughs> there's a, there's a part there's a part in my uh, in my first video where I talk about how I I show how these um these Bible handbooks. Do you remember these Unger's uh, Bible handbook and Halley's yes Bible handbook the Unger's text? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I I show how how they talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls oh, I heard very the name much in the same. So long. What's up? Sorry, so I haven't heard of the 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 Ungers, the word Ungers in a long time. Sorry. Yeah. Keep going. But I I mean it, it just it made such a so I included those in there because this this made such a um this had such an impact on me when I started grad school. And I, I started spending a lot of time uh, with the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I started learning about all this stuff. I was actually, this is a true story. I was, um, my wife and I went to my in-laws for Christmas break. And in their basement on the bookshelf was a copy of uh, Unger's Bible Handbook. And I pulled it off and I started thumbing through it. And I'm like, I wonder... Like I really, I just wonder what 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 he has to say about uh, about the Old Testament and about um, manuscripts and about oh, I wonder if he even has anything to say about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I was absolutely like gobsmacked that it just it was all wrong, right? I was like, holy cow, <laughs> look at that! So yeah, yeah, that just it was all downhill from there. <laughs> right yep oh <laughs> um i got one more question i got saved uh Kay. from nick jr i want to ask you and then we're gonna wrap things all up because right. i'm tired y'all all right this has been a lot yeah of fun. i'm getting pretty tired too <laughs> yeah i probably imagine. not pour a second glass <laughs> but let's Here we uh, are. let's do it to what extent are Christian universities contributing to biblical scholarship considering they have faith positions that pigeonhole them? Pigeonhole them. I, I, I have a lot to Boy, say about this question. You you have a lot to say about this question? So I, I mean, I yeah. have to say at the outset that there are, so right away, um, not all Christian universities are the same. They, yes. they run the, the gamut. There's a spectrum. There's some very good yep. ones. The, the biblical studies program at uh, the university that I got my master's degree from and where I taught uh, for a number of years, Evangelical Christian University, the biblical studies department there is is excellent. Um, you know, they don't they don't pull punches. They teach the text historically critically. They, um, you know, they respect the scholarship they are i would say their presentation is as non-confessional as you would find in any other uh department at any other university so like they can be good um but unfortunately you also have places like you know liberty university or you have places like the trinity evangel or trinity international university which is also trinity evangelical evangelical divinity school um or biola uh where there is this like fierce apologetic mandate um see this is the thing I, and i you know i mean i i think people could appreciate that i really do have like a deep-seated hatred <laughs> of apologetics um i expect it comes through and honestly like a lot of that comes from uh, my experiences in the biblical studies department at Trinity, where all my teachers were pulling their hair out uh, because of guys in the philosophy department or guys in the, you know, at the, we had a seminary that was, uh, that was attached to the university who would like do their damnedest to unravel and and or, or or I guess put back together all the pieces that you know those those rotten. Uh, I've I actually heard a professor talk about like 
everybody in the Bible department at the school that I was I was at first learning and then working, uh, a, a philosophy professor talking about how um, those guys had all basically sold themselves out to the Enlightenment. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm what? sorry, fuck off. But like, <laughs> really? It, so I, I, I'll tell the story here. I, in grad school, um, because there was the, the, the grad school at the university and there was the seminary, which was a lot bigger. Um, some of the courses tended to get, they would get cross listed. This is a way for, for institutions to save money. So you're not teaching like the same course in two different institutions that are basically like right across the, the quadrangle from each other. Right. So lots mm -hmm. of these, yep. we had lots of courses that were cross listed with the seminary and my, my first year in grad school, I took a, an old it was a it was a class on Old Testament exegesis and it was offered it was a cross listed class with the seminary and the guy who taught it he's a he was a professor at the seminary but a really really good scholar his name is uh, Rob Hebert he's an excellent guy um, but I think he approached the course like this he looked at he had students from like an MDiv program. He had students from like a master's of theology program offered through the seminary and he had students from an MA program offered through the university. And he opened up the academic calendars for each of these programs and read the course description for each one. And the course description for each of these programs was so different that he ended up making three syllabi. And then as we got together, I think there was like 15 of us in this class. He's like, well, you're in the MDiv program, so you get this syllabus. You're two in the MTH, you get this one. You're an MA student, you get this one. So um, we're all going to be looking at the, the book of Ezekiel. And specifically, we were looking at um, uh, textual uh, changes and redaction or editing in the book of Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. Um so, but he's like, and we all had different, we all had different projects. We had different, he gave us like different exams. Um, but it was like, it was utter chaos in the actual lectures. Sounds like where, it. Wow. oh, it was so awful because the, the one or two of the guys who were in the MDiv program insisted on, like, we can't even talk about this stuff. The, the, we can't even talk about this stuff unless we talk about an inspired redactor, right? Uh, and we wasted redactor. so much time <laughs> just evaluating the, you know, the the motivations of and and how you know the Holy Spirit at work. And I don't know what the yeah, like dude, I ended oh. up I ended up going to the I ended up going to like my grad school administrator who was actually um, Craig Evans. That's probably a name most people, a lot of people are familiar with. Was it with. He's, really? He's a, yeah. He was the second reader on my MA thesis. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Huh. So I like Craig. Like, as a scholar, I think he does a lot of good things. Um, you know, I, I know. he is. He's He does a lot of apologetic things too, but I have a, I have a soft spot for for craig anyhow i went to craig I and i said to him look i'm i'm not getting my money's worth here like i have to talk about and we, we we spend all our time we waste all our time talking about an inspired redactor poor rob hebert the the guy who's teaching this class like it's chaos it's nonsense and and i actually managed to get him to you know go to the university like the registrar's office and say this isn't working you need to give all our guys like the ma students you need to give them credit so that they can actually like take this class again properly from somebody you know in a in a situation where they're not going to be encumbered by all this nonsense so i ended up having to do wow. it again um but uh yeah but this is so i tell this story as a way of like showing the kinds of things 
that that happened. That is the struggle. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yep. it was wow. it was nuts. So, yeah. But to his credit, like to Craig Evans's credit, he's like, yeah, this is <laughs> this is garbage. Um, and yeah, we're gonna make sure that you you know at least get to take this course again without having to pay for it. So the second time around, I did it with, uh, with, um, uh, Marty Abeg, who is my, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, and he is currently the editor in chief of the new Dead Sea Scrolls editions coming out with Brill. And it was a wonderful course in which we, we studied, um, David's, uh david's basically the 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 beginnings of the uh of the davidic uh dynasty uh with particularly mm. close attention paid to um uh second samuel chapter seven it was an awesome course uh the oh, paper oh, i wrote oh. for that course was over 50 pages uh, anyway 50 wow sorry that. yeah I, I got an A. No, I good, got an A. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. Because of course you did. Oh my gosh. Uh, uh, all right, y'all. Well, I'm gonna have to wrap things up. I'm I'm very tired. I'm sure Dr. Kip is too, but this, this has been a fun. lot of fun. I, I am uh, hungry though. I was thank you guys for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you did. I gotta go eat. Um but yeah, check out Dr. Kip's channel. Link in the description. Yes, please. Highly recommend. And uh, stay and tuned can I for just, more. Be, before I go, can I do a can I do a quick plug? Yes. Um. So I just I just filmed uh, a course, uh, which is going to be offered on MVP courses. Uh, MVP courses offers all sorts of uh, uh, it's like university level instruction. These aren't university courses, but they're like. They're like university teachers and some of the best. Uh, James Tabor is doing uh, a great course on Mark. Uh, Dale C. Allison uh, Jr. Oh, yeah. Has a course on uh, on, the, uh, on the historical the Jesus. Description. Yeah, put put a put a link in the in the description there. Um, so I am uh, I just finished uh, filming for a course that I have titled uh, Ancient Israelite Religions. Facts on the ground and propaganda in the Bible. Uh, it's 18 lectures. It's over 68,000 words. It's 122 pages of notes. 18 lectures? Yeah. Yeah. That's so, a lot. That's like an um, entire semester. Yeah, I yeah, I do it in in an in, in, and this is a course. So this is a course that I have taught. Um I, I used there. to teach this course at Trinity. I've dramatically yeah, revised right. it because I don't have to you know, worry about the confessional bullshit anymore. Um, but it's basically an exploration of the intersection between the archaeology and the text of the Hebrew Bible with respect to what the ancient Israelites really believed, how they practiced their religions, why the text uh, is written the way it is. It's a course about history. It's a course about archaeology. Uh, it's a course about culture. And uh, I I like to I like to do lots of stuff with uh, with like television and movies and and music and art and that sort of thing. So it's I think it's pretty entertaining. It should be available in the spring, and I hope everyone checks it out. They make it fun. I try oh, to. That this is the first time hearing about. I'm that. a I'm, fun guy. You are a fun guy. You're you're one of my favorite. Oh, people somebody to asked me. He hasn't set a price point on it yet, but all his other so all the courses currently offered on MVP courses are thirty nine ninety nine. Um, mine will probably be a little bit more than that because it's like three times the size. So, uh, I don't know how much it'll cost yet, but it's not going to be like it's not going to be expensive. It's worth it either way. Yes, it is. You're damn right it is. College courses are expensive as fuck if you yeah. actually take them at college. So to get them yeah, for it's... 
a fraction of the under a hundred bucks on the internet, right? That you can take at your pace. That do just what exactly? And you have it forever. What a, what a data be like you. The, the nice thing about this is you've got access to this stuff for the rest of your life. So even after you've done the course, if there's something you like or if there's something you want to remind yourself of, you can go back and look at it and watch it again or, you know, so. Yep. Very good. I think it's a good deal. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody, for joining the show. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again. All right, yep. From the interview. Uh, I was a little bit my nervous. Pleasure. Because. My pleasure. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> why yeah well because my i uh my my co-host uh didn't oh, show up and usually right. she, she you had to carry the, the show she's very good yes yeah she's very good asking questions you did all right uh so I was, you did she was good. like i can't do it I was like, okay i think yeah. i'll be all right wow. yeah this one well this one say hi yeah uh, say hi to natty nat i will do Not <laughs>